Thank you for tuning into Belmont Journal. I'm your host, Kim Haley Jackson. The annual town election is April 4th. There is one town-wide race in this year's election. Three candidates are running for two three-year school committee seats. Joining me today is one of the candidates in the race, Rachel Watson. Welcome, Rachel. Thank you. Can you tell our viewers about yourself? Sure. So I moved to Belmont about eight years ago. Um, I am an HR professional now, but I have worked in the legal services field and I have um, my JD from Cardozo in New York City and I spent one year in Japan getting that degree. And I also have a BA in East Asian Studies where I spent one year in China and I have an RN and I was working in the ICU at a hospital in California before I got to where I am today. I have two boys. One is in the lab program at Butler. He's in third grade. And my older son is in fifth grade at Chenry. Okay, what brought you to Belmont? Um, it was actually my ex-husband's job. He came here to work in the pharmaceutical industry like a lot of folks do. Okay, um, can you tell me about the volunteer positions you've held in town, if any? Sure, so um, right now I am the chair of the superintendent screening committee and that's pretty busy, but we'll be all done soon. And I'm also co-chair of the Special Education Parent Advisory Council, which is um, actually a legally mandated group for each school to help parents understand their rights um, for their children who are in special education. Okay, thank you, that seemed very busy. I stay yes. busy. I like to stay busy. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> Can you tell us about what skills and experience you have that you think would make you qualified to serve on the school committee? Well, as you can tell, I've lived in a few different kinds of places. I have worked in different kinds of fields. I pick up new things very, very quickly, and I actually enjoy tackling something brand new to me. Um, and also, you know, being a nurse, being an attorney, even being an HR professional, it involves being an advocate for somebody or something. And also being able to look at regulations and understand what they mean for an organization or for an individual on sort of a big picture scale. Like how is this gonna impact this person or how is this gonna impact our organization overall? which I think is really important if you're gonna be sitting on the school committee, you need that big t picture orientation, you need to be able to look at a change in a rule or a proposed policy and be able to envision what's that gonna mean for folks on the ground. Okay, and why did you decide to run for school committee? Well, as part of my role as co-chair of the uh, Special Education Parent Advisory Council, we usually say CPAC, but sometimes people get a little confused when I say that. So part of that role is to advocate for um, families with the school committee and the administration. So I've been attending all the school committee meetings, most of them in person, and you know, sort of speaking on how what they're discussing is gonna affect um, families and children who are in special education um, or bringing up concerns that parents have been sharing with me in front of the school committee, and I also meet regularly with the, uh, the administration. So for me, I look at all the challenges that are coming up, and we all know that our school is facing some big challenges ahead, and I thought to myself, I'm here. I see what's coming. I have a lot of ideas about this, and I should really step up. I should bring what I have and what I know and put myself forward to take this on. Can, can you talk about some of the needs that um, you've heard from parents? Absolutely, absolutely. So first of all, of course, everybody's talking about the budget and concerns about how, how are we gonna maintain quality for all of our students mm -hmm. um, and still fit within this budget that we have, right? I mean, we all kind of understand that a lot of the tax money in Belmont comes from our residents. There's not a ton of room to sort of put more money into the whole town or the school. So how are we gonna do that? 
parents are very worried about that. Parents are concerned, you know, I hear from parents from sort of both ends of the spectrum, right? We have um, students who are struggling mm -hmm. and feeling left behind and parents are really concerned about that, especially after the pandemic. And um, we have, especially in the middle school ages, parents who are really worried because their students master the curriculum quickly and they're feeling uninspired, they're feeling unengaged, it's hard to get them going to school. And um, the other thing that I hear basically from everybody is um, communication. Mm. People feel often sort of surprised about decisions when they come down or they feel like they're inundated with emails and emails and a piece of paper, and yet it's still hard for them to filter out the things that matter to them right. and sort of understand that in a timely way. Or, you know, we do have a lot of families in our town who are um, English is a second language, mm -hmm. and waiting through paragraph after paragraph after paragraph is pretty exhausting for them. So I think finding ways to sort of streamline communication is, is a big concern. Okay. So with, with all of that, <laughs> <laughs> of that wide range of needs that you're hearing about, what would you consider the top priorities for the school district at this time? Um, one is, uh, I think number one, is look for ways to create efficiencies in the budget, ways where we can get more for less, basically. Um, and I especially would focus on the number of special education students who are going out of district because not only is it expensive, it's a big equity issue. Um, I would focus on our middle schools. I think we've all kind of heard the maligning of our middle school mm -hmm. grades and programs and you know now is a great time to, as we're sort of breaking it up into upper elementary and junior high school to look at the culture and the program there. And obviously, you know, how are we gonna get the communication to parents and also to the town mm -hmm. so that our wider community can understand what's happening in our schools, why we're so concerned about certain things. Um, and also like some of the great things that our students and teachers are doing, even, you know, against the adversity that we're facing in terms of budget, we have fabulous teachers and fabulous students. Do you have specific ideas for making improvements to Belmont Public Schools, um, especially given the limited budget? How would you prioritize? Okay, well, first thing that I would prioritize is looking at the amount of space that we have now and which students are going out of district the most often. Mm -hmm and try to bring those programs that we need most back in district, back in house with the more, um, the extra space that we're now gonna have. Because first of all, um, let's keep our students close to the home. You know, nobody wants to go and drive 30 miles to pick their kid up from school because right. they aren't feeling well. And also that's an equity thing, right? Students should not be segregated from each other because they have a disability. Um, and it gives us control over the quality of the program and our families, a, you know, a chance to be in touch with the teachers in a, a different way, right? Like we all know what it is when you're picking your kids up from school, you're dropping them off, you're meeting with the teachers face-to-face -face more often. That, that's not something that you can sort of put a price on, right? And also it'll give us control over the cost mm. and save us, like, right away we'll be saving money on the transportation costs, um, having to pay tuition to another school, mm -hmm. which we don't have a lot of control over. Part of the reason why it's such a big budget item is the state authorized it, um, an increase in these tuitions this year, up 14%, and we have no control over that. And these programs are not optional, right? Like we have to provide access to the curriculum for students with disabilities, not only is it the right thing to do, there are laws around that. Mm -hmm. So if we want to make sure that we're doing it and it's getting done right and save money, bringing it in district is the right thing to do. The other thing is I would really like to look at the culture 
of our, like I said, our middle and high school, our upper elementary and our mm -hmm. junior high. Because right now, it's, it could be a lot more student-centered. I asked my son, I said, what would you change? He's like, more recess, mom. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, kids who are 10, 11 years old, they still need to get outside and run around. Um, we need to focus the way we do discipline on more of a positive behavioral supports mm -hmm. and less on um, sort of punitive and negative messaging to students. And we need to, going back to what I said about accessibility and flexibility in the program, we need to look at ways where we can make the curriculum and the teaching methods a little bit more flexible and a little bit more accessible. Our teachers need support to do that, mm -hmm. um, whether it's materials or professional development or whatever it is, so that students who are struggling you know, can access the curriculum and students who sort of master it quickly have a way to go deeper, to dive deeper, to go a little further. And, you know, I say the word accessible and sometimes people get nervous. Mm -hmm. They get a little <laughs> nervous. They think that means that we're going to not have a rigorous program. And that is not what that means at all. What it means is providing students who learn in a way that's a little bit different from the standard way the supports that they need so they can access the same rigor as everyone else. Okay. And also, like I said, I really, you know, honestly, I, I would love to see some kind of position in the school that's surely about communication and surely about how do we, how do we make this accessible to all parents, mm -hmm. meet them where they're at, and how do we maybe get word out to the town wide a little bit better. So that that brings me to the to the next question. You sort of answered it, but maybe in a, in a in a different way. So, like, how would you address the different needs of all the students within the school district? Because we've talked about um, we've talked about it from the CPAP perspective um, a little bit around like our advanced placement students. So, you know, we have you know a wide swath of students in the middle who aren't falling for AP. They don't fall into CPAC, right? So they, they are our middle of the pack kids. Um, you know, and so how do we meet those needs? First of all, I, you know, we can't make light of the things that are sometimes considered extra in school. There are a lot of kids for whom the reason why they show up every day is because they get to play their instrument. It's because they get to play sports. It's because they're gonna make art, you know, we have to take those things seriously as a school. And we also have to make sure we show that we value um, those skills and talents that students bring. Um, going back to what I said about positive behavioral support, you know, when students are struggling with their behaviors, first I would hope that we will all become curious hmm. as to What's, what's happening for that student and what's bringing that on. And then find ways to sort of shore up whatever it is that they're lacking that's causing them to have a behavior that's not desired in the school. And it, it cannot be stated enough that social emotional learning is not something separate from academics. It's not something that we, we do because it's fluffy, <laughs> okay? but. <laughs> It's been shown in research to enhance academic achievement. When, you know, you can't go to school and learn if you are too anxious about what this other student over here is gonna say to you tomorrow, mm -hmm. or what your teacher thinks of you. You can't go to school and learn if you constantly feel like the sore thumb sticking out, right? Like that's part of where sort of a DEI curriculum comes in, right, is where we learn as a community, as a school community, as students, as teacher, as staff, to make an environment where all the students come in, they feel welcome, they feel valued, they feel safe, they feel like one of us, and nobody feels like one of them. Okay. Okay. Has there been a decision made by the school committee 
in the past years or so that you have disagreed with? And if so, can you tell us about that and what you would have done differently? Well, you know, I guess because I've been sitting in on so many school committee meetings lately, you know, I look at how hard everyone is working being in meetings until 10 or 11 o'clock because our school committee really does care about our students and about doing things right and having a full discussion. But these are volunteers and families want to come in and have input, but when the meeting is going that late, it's really hard. So, you know, I wonder if there wouldn't be a way to schedule the meeting so they can have, we have them more often, but shorter mm -hmm. so that it's easier for people to participate, easier to get, um, make more time to get input from the community when they do come. And, you know, I understand there's a lot of um, regulations around open meeting laws, but a lot of folks, they get their news on social media these days. They follow a page, it pops up in their news feed, wherever they follow things. You know, for us to think about ways that we can channel that to get information out to people without running afoul of those open meeting laws. Okay, and what is your vision for education in Belmont? Um, you know, I think I think it's pretty clear from what I said. It's it's a uh, that we have a school culture where all means all, absolutely all. All students feel competent in the classroom. All students feel welcome and valued when they come to school. Um, where, you know, we look at things with a growth mindset, right? There's always gonna be a challenge that we're facing somewhere, whether that's as an individual student or individual teacher, as a classroom, as a school, as a district, but those are opportunities to grow opportunities to change the things that we would like to be different and not something to sort of beat ourselves up or it's let's grow let's grow together and let's be curious let's be curious about how did this come about what are you know we usually think about it this way but could we think about it another way could we could we get more perspectives on this can we you know let's you know with curiosity like a I mean, we're learning here, this mm -hmm. is school. And if you wanna learn, you have to get curious. So I sort of have a vision, you know, where students come in, they're in an environment where they're encouraged to be curious, to ask questions, and they learn how to ask the right questions, how to speak to each other with compassion, how to ask a question with respect and but not back away from talking about the hard things, not to, to have that in their minds and have it in their minds that everybody is there to grow together. Okay, and, and lastly, Rachel, um, can you tell us why someone should vote for you? Well, um, I think the first reason is because when I see a challenge, it's not my nature to back off, it's to lean in. Do, you know, like that's, that's part of the reason why I decided to run. I'm not afraid to face a challenge, and I have a lot of problem-solving skills. <laughs> I mean, when you're a nurse, you look at, you know, what's going on, you take a lot of data, and you get a picture, and you have to kind of guess what the problem is, right? And, the, and same thing with the law, right? Like, you have your regulations, you have your client who has a problem, you get the data, you look, you got your evidence, and you tell a story about what is the problem and how you think it should be fixed, right? And that's, that's, um, that's the thing that moves me and um, that I'm quite good at. So I think that uh, folks should vote for me because I'm a problem solver. Great. Well, thank you for stopping by the studio to tell us about yourself, Rachel. Um, thank you to our viewers for tuning in. I'm your host, Kim Haley Jackson. Please don't forget to vote on April 4th. Thanks for having me.